So I'm talking about immigration from mainly from Galicia. And what I'm really trying to focus on is on, on a problem if immigration is considered to be a threat for the Galician village or uh, is it maybe a chance for the Galician village. The Austrian province Galicia, or to use the official title, the Kingdom of Galicia and Lodomeria as a territory was called by Viennese bureaucrats after the annexation of, of this part of Poland in 17, 1772, um, existed as a political entity, as a crown land of the Habsburg monarchy, only for about 150 years, from 72, 1772 to 1918. Although the name Galicia and Lodomeria suggests a long history, Galicia is not really rooted in the past. Uh, but it was a political creation of the late, 19, uh, late 18th century. As I said, it was really created, the name was created by Viennese bureaucracy. Galicia became the largest crown land of the Habsburg Empire and at the same time it was the most populous. When the Austrians took over the territory from the Kingdom of Poland, it had approximately 2.6 million inhabitants. Uh, the western part was mostly Polish, as everybody here knows, with a Jew considerable Jewish minority, while east of the San River, Ruthenians, as the Austrians called the Ukrainians then, were making up the majority. So it was 65% Ukrainians in the east, 20% Poles and 30% Jews, the rest members of smaller nations, like Germans, Armenians, Slovaks, and, and so on. In 1914, Galicia had a population of about 8.2 million, 46% of them Roman Catholic, that's mainly Polish, of course, 42% Greek Catholics, mostly Ukrainians, and 11% uh, Jewish faith. So Galicia was predominantly, of course, a rural province with not much industry to speak of. And the industry there was, this was mainly dependent on agriculture. So it was sawmills, was distilleries, breweries, and things, but uh, not much other industry. There were only two big cities in this huge province. That's on, in the west, it was Kraków, the former Polish uh, capital, medieval Polish capital, Kraków. And in the east, of course, it was Lviv, or Lemberg, as it was called in German, or Lwów, as it was called in Polish. There were some natural resources in Galicia, mainly salt, you know, the famous historical salt mines of Wieliczka, and oil, which made Austria hungry for a short time before the First World War, the third largest oil producing country in the world, after the United States and Russia. The most important oil fields were in or Boryslav in this region. The terrible conditions in the oil fields, especially in the beginning of this industry, the exploitation of the workers, mostly daily laborers, many of them Ukrainians, and in the beginning also uh, many Jews as workers, were popular topics for Polish and Ukrainian writers. On the one hand, the oil boom sparked hopes for the development, rapid development of the region, which was called accordingly Galician Pennsylvania or Galician California, or even El Dorado. But on the other hand, the conditions were so bad, so harsh, so unhealthy and often dangerous that the region was called also Galician Hell. Uh, one of the first to describe this exotic and rather dark and dreary world, world was the prolific Ukrainian writer Ivan Franco, who by the way was also writing in German. He, was, he wrote beautiful German, Ivan Franco, and Polish. So he was really a three-lingual writer. Uh, and he wrote about, uh, he comes from this area, of course, as everybody knows. And he writes about, about this oil industry. In his Borislav cycle, Franco presents the dismal picture of a Galician hell. Though some scholars point out uh, that his description might have been realistic, but it was probably not real. That's uh, Jaroslav Hritzak pointed this out in uh, in one of his essays. The best known stories, of course, are Boa Constrictor and Borislav is laughing. 
Polish writers also dealt with this topic, and I'm only going to mention here one, that's the Polish writer Józef Rogosz, w piekle Galicyjskim, in Galician hell, there you find also already this title, which was at, this, at its time a very widely read novel. And he also writes, he also criticizes the working conditions in the oil field and the business practices of the early oil magnates, who were mainly Jews. Of course, we have to take into consideration that Józef Rogosz was a typically very nationalistic, I'd even say chauvinistic Polish writer. So he's writing in the spirit of a radical Polish nationalism, depicting Jews and, of course, being a Pole, Ukrainians as the main adversaries. Galicia was blessed with fertile land in most areas, but it was nevertheless not able to feed its inhabitants. Overpopulation combined with backward agricultural techniques and small land holdings, mostly smaller than five hectares, led to endemic famine, according to contemporary sources, caused many, which according to contemporary sources, caused many thousand deaths among the rural population. Now there is a discussion going on if these contemporary authors were not exaggerating this. You know, when you, when you read authors of the 19th century, there's always, a, uh, they always talk about Galician misery, you know, about the poverty, about Galician dirt. Uh, I'm going to mention an, uh, one very famous Polish author, Stanisław Szczepanowski, who wrote a, a book about Galician misery, uh, Nędza Galicyjska. And now modern uh, scholars think that this might have been exaggerated, you know, that the conditions after all were not so bad maybe. But anyway, it were probably in comparison to other European countries, they weren't so bad. Because when you read them, you, you really have the, the picture, you know, that Galicia, of course, was called the poor house of the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, which was true, it was the poorest province. But there were many poor houses at that time in Europe. You know, there were many countries almost as poor as Galicia. You know, I mean, we just have to think, even Switzerland, you know, was at that time a fairly poor country. Sweden, one of the richest countries nowadays, was a poor country. This is one of the reasons of emigration. Of course, Ireland, I mean, the famine in Ireland, which was, of course, earlier, in the 40s, but it was very, very poor. So this Galician misery, so many people write about, you know, in comparison with Europe at that time, sort of it loses a bit of its, its uh, uh, darkness, really. Uh, as I said, Galicia did not have much industry of, it, of its own. So the sale of cheap products, shoes, clothes, furniture, etc., from the highly industrialized provinces of Austria was ruining the little industry that was in Galicia, this home industry mainly, in, and small craftsmen who were being pushed out of business by this uh, import. And all this led Galicia, as I've mentioned already, <coughs> being called the poor house of the monarchy. Or in Polish, Gorizia i Gwodomeria. You know, this is a play of word, of course, because Gowy in, in Polish means naked, and Gwodny means hungry, so it's a land of the naked and the hungry. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm, I'm known for not having a mobile phone, so this never happens to me. <laughs> uh, so all these factors, you know, I mean, there was poverty in, in Galicia. There's no doubt about it. You know, it was a very poor country. It couldn't feed its, in, its people, you know, although it was a very fertile country. Uh, because the, the agriculture, you know, the conditions of agriculture were very backwards. So there, there had to be a solution, you know, what to do. And it was over, overpopulated. So one of the solutions, of course, was emigration, naturally enough. So the emigration from Galicia to America started relatively late in comparison to other European countries, of course. That is in the 1880s. In other European countries like Sweden, Ireland, Germany, also Switzerland, 
uh, it has started, began much earlier. One of the reasons why it was so late in Galicia was of course the fact that this Austrian province had no direct access to the sea. It was a long way to the ports. It was a long way to the next ports that was mainly Hamburg or Bremen. Those were the two main ports for Galician immigrants to, to go to, to America. So many of your great grandparents probably had left from, from Bremen or from Hamburg on a, on a ship. Uh, so this distance had to be covered by train. So you needed real, a fairly developed railroad system for mass emigration. Otherwise, this was impossible. So yet, really, you had to develop this first. Um, emigration, of course, was not really a new phenomenon in Galicia. There had been em emigration sort of before, but not to America, but to other countries, to neighboring countries. There had been emigration to Germany. There had been emigration uh, even to Russia. There had been emigration to Romania and to Hungary. So these people, these workers, they would go, usually they would be called seasonal workers. They would go for a season, a couple of months, to work there, and then they'll come back with the money they had earned there. So they, they were really used, you know, when you need money, when you're hungry, somebody in the family goes, goes somewhere to work, if, if there's work to be found. Uh, so this was, that's one of the reasons also why the emigration, once it started from Galicia, it caught on very quickly. Because they were used to this, you know, that this was one of the ways you know, to solve their problems was to emigrate to make money. Uh, of course, it's really almost impossible to establish exact figures how many people left in this early period, how many people went to America or to Canada for that matter, or Latin America. There was also emigration, of course, to Latin America, Brazil, Argentina. Uh, as you know, there are not many good statistics on this, and, and they're based most, mostly, the numbers are based on what the people said, where they come from, and who they were. So we don't know whether really Ukrainians were the Poles. I mean, but the, with the Jews, you, you usually knew. But Ukrainians, Poles, Slovaks, you know, was difficult. Because many of the people at that time did not really think much about their national, national identity. You know, this was not important for them. So they would rather call them in Polish, Tutejsi. I'm from this village or from this area, and that's it. You know, so he didn't consider himself being Ukrainian. So when they asked him, he just said where he was from, from which village, but he didn't say I'm Ukrainian or I'm, uh, I'm Pope. Uh, so on the whole, it's safe to assume that between 1880 and 1914, well over a million left Galicia to America, well over a million. This of course includes Ukrainians, Poles, Jews, and Germans. Uh, and as to gender, it's at least twice as many men as women left, you know, emigrated, <coughs> and usually it was young men. So it was approximately the same with what we have today. You know, when you look at the migrants today, it's men, young men, mainly. You know, and, and then they pull the families. You know, this is what we call the push and pull uh, factor. You know, they are pushed by poverty and then they pull their family. And this was also what happened with the Galicians. Many Galicians, of course, then brought over their family. Uh, so, the emigration from Galicia to Canada started much later than to the United, started later than to the United States. It intensified at the end of the 19th century after the so-called Brazilian fever had calmed down. In the first half of the 1890s, what we call the Brazilian fever, because there was a mass immigration to Brazil all of a sudden broke out. And that had ceased and then many people went to, to, to Canada. And of course it ceased with the outbreak of the First World War when the gates were closed for Austrian citizens, you know, naturally enough. Again, it's very difficult to give exact numbers as most of the available data are based on declarations by the emigrants themselves on religion, regional origin, and language. 
The main reasons for emigration were, of course, bad living conditions, lack of land, and poverty. America, where in the eyes of the Galicians, was really a land of promise. You know, it was a land where milk and honey flowed. It was a land where gold was to be found on the streets, and so on. And the small agents, you know, because usually it was not just the small peasant who decided, okay, I go to America, you know, it's, I have nothing to, 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 uh, to live on here, so I decided to go to America. But it was usually, was, there was some uh, immigration propaganda and that was done by, by agents. These agents were working mainly for shipping agencies, because the ships bringing the, these immigrants to, to, to America, they needed always new passengers, you know, of course for steerage. These people were put like, like freight into the boats, you know, you push as many as possible into a boat, into a ship, and, and, and so they needed agents, you know, to get new, new passengers all the time. And these agents, they were really traveling from village to village through Galicia, and they were telling these fantastic tales, you know. I mean, of course, we have to consider, you know, people were mostly illiterate. They had no idea what America meant. They had no idea where America was. You know, they didn't know anything about it. So you could tell them anything about America. You could tell them that you just bent down and there is gold, you know, or you, you tell them these other fantastic, fantastic tales, uh, like the one, you know, with the uh, Archduke Rudolf, you know, who had committed suicide in, in Meiling, you know, and they said, no, this is not really true. This is a lie. He had not committed suicide. He's alive. He went to Brazil and he became the emperor of Brazil. And he was known that he had a sympathy for the Ukrainians. So these agents, you know, they went with letters, alleged letters written by Rudolf, who had been dead already for years, through the these letters aloud to the people, you know, is calling on his beloved Ukrainians to come and join him in Brazil and they'll be you know, given land and God knows what, you know. So many people, of course, believed this. And there were these other fantastic things, you know, they were, they were told. When I was writing this book on, on the emigration from Galicia, you know, the Emperor of America, I mean, the title is no coincidence, you know, the Emperor of America, I found there was a big trial of, on these agents in Wadowice, you know, it's a small town in Poland, in, west, uh, in western U Galicia, not far from Krakow. There was a trial already in 1888. There were dozens of these agents and helpers of these agents were put on trial because of fraud and, and God knows what. And then there was this f huge trial going on and these people, you know, the, the uh, witnesses were asked, you know, what did they do? They had an office in Oświęcim, in Auschwitz, you know, because this was an, on the border from, between Austria and Prussia, and a it was a train station. So they had an office there, and they were working for HAPAC, for this Hamburg America line, you know, for a shipping company, big shipping company, selling tickets to these immigrants. And they caught them, you know, and they led them to the office, and then one of their practices was they had a, a alarm clock, you know, the old, these old alarm clocks. I mean, you've probably seen them, you know, these huge alarm clocks, you know, where you wind them up and when they ring, I mean, you know, a real racket. So they wound it up and then it was ringing. Then he held, this to, to, held it to his ear and he said to the, to the farmer, to the small peasant who was standing in front of him, he said, this is a telegraph, you know, and now I'm going to phone or I'm send a telegram to Hamburg to ask if there's a place on the, sh on the ship for you, you know. And they spoke into this alarm clock and asked, you know, if there was a place for this peasant, you know, Vasil, I don't know, you know. And then he listened, ah, okay, there is a place. And for this telegram, this poor peasant always had to pay, you know. And in the end, I mean, they, they did it a couple of times, you know, sending telegrams to different people, in the end, they sent a telegram to the Emperor of America, you know. So they sent a telegram and they spoke into this uh, alarm clock and asked the Emperor of America if he was willing to receive this Vasil, you know. And they listened again 
And the emperor agreed, okay, but Vasily had to pay for, of course, for this. And at this trial, you know, the judge asked one of the witnesses, one of these poor peasants, you know, who had come back. And he asked him, but look, I mean, how could you believe, how could you be so stupid to believe that an alarm clock is a telegraph? And the peasant said, but look, I mean, we didn't know what a watch was. We didn't know what a clock was. In our village, nobody had a watch. There was no clock, not even on the, on the church. So we didn't know, you know, and we'd never seen a telegram. So we didn't know about this. And of course, now these agents took advantage of this. Uh, so there's numerous of these fantastic stories, really. When you, when you read the newspapers of these, these times, I mean, sometimes they're funny, but of course for the peasants, you know, who have been, been cheated there, they were not so funny. I mean, they, they, they really fleeced them, you know, they got the last money out of them, you know, and they sent them then with, with a ticket on a, on a ship, you know, to Hamburg, and on the boat and off you go. And of course, then they also sent bills, they wanted more passengers, you know, they asked them to give him the address, if he has any relatives at home, brother, or God knows what, you know, and they sent letters in his name. The agents sent letters, because I mean, most of the, these peasants were illiterate, so they couldn't write anyway. But the agent sent letters, you know, that are fantastic conditions here in America. Please come, you know, pack everything, please come. You know, whole family, come. And so the agent got more, more customers. But of course, it, was, it would be a simplification to draw the conclusion that the Galician misery the poor living conditions, the poverty and the hunger, the lack of work and so on, were the only causes for emigration. They played, of course, an important the main role, but when, you, when you're happy and make a good living, there's no reason to leave. So if, if you're rich, I mean, why should you leave, in, even in Galicia? Uh, but the very poor, and this is, this is also true today, the very poor, the poorest, they don't leave either. Because first of all, they don't have the money. Because even the poor guy needs some money to go to Hamburg, to go to Bremen, to buy a ticket on a, on a ship. So the poorest didn't have the money. And what's even more important, they didn't have the energy left. You know, They didn't have any hope left. So they were the ones who's, who stayed behind. So they were physically and you know, psychologically, they were not prepared. Because for emigration, you need a lot of energy. You need optimism. Without that, it's, it's really impossible. And the peasants, of course, in those days, the peasants in Galicia, uh, they had little reason to be optimistic. So they had little energy. I mean, we know, reading about Galician literature, reading Galician literature, you know, we, we, we know how they felt. So it was really quite surprising that so many people got up and left home, you know, and, and because you needed a lot of, of, of courage also, you know, to, to, to go to America. And it, it's quite surprising. But there's also one, one reason why they did it, that these conditions in Galicia had, were a changing, you know, this sort of, uh, this feeling that, okay, everything is going to, to stay the same all the time. Now, this was changing in the 1890s. Because before, you know, it was like this. The local big landowner, the representative of the state, mainly the gendarme, and they were really ruling this world. Their world was the gospel. But then this changed in the late 19th century, and even the poor peasants learned that they had certain rights. They took part in election campaigns uh, and meetings, and they not longer automatically voted for the local, you know, the candidate of the local landowner, big landowner, uh, but rather for somebody who is protecting their rights. And that was very often a Ukrainian candidate, of course. In those days, you know, there were many, so really, they, they woke up, and this was also helping emigration. There's this new uh, feeling that he counts, 
and he can change the conditions. This was very important for, for, uh, um, for emigration. And of course, there were other, other conditions, you know, like the development of the U Ukrainian village, the development of Ukrainian consciousness by reading clubs, uh, associations, you know, prosvita, of course, associations and, and assurance association and whatever, you know. So the people got more knowledge and that's one of, this was very helpful in emigration. But emigration was always a two-edged sword for the village and the whole country. It was a curse on one side and it was a blessing. On the one hand, it was considered to be a threat for the village and a traditional peasant society. But on the other hand, it was also seen as a big chance. The small peasant or the farmhand often experienced emigration as a very painful process. The Ukrainian author Vasil Stefanik describes emigration as an existential disaster. The Ukrainian peasants were torn up by the roots like oaks. Stefanik writes, from life-giving Mother Earth and thrown like firewood, another quote, into the railroad cars to be transported to Hamburg or Bremen. The Ukrainian peasant was leaving his home because of the children, quote, for whom there was no more bread in this country, as Stefanik puts it. This became even worse, of course, after 1918, when this part was taken over by Poland and the conditions for the Ukrainians really worsened. They didn't get better, but they worsened. It was Poland at that time was very chauvinistic, very nationalistic, very anti-Ukrainian. But I don't have to tell you this here in this. Uh, this you know probably much better than we. In an answer to a letter from the village published in 1927 in the Ukrainian paper Dilo, Stefan, Stefanik writes that the Ukrainian peasants know very well that, quote, as long as Panska, Polska, Poland of the big landowners will be in existence, our farmer won't get any land from her. And his life without land, that is a stone around the neck and straight into the water. Uh, so, the emigrants, as I said, were usually the most enterprising elements in the village. You know, they were the daring ones. They were getting up and doing something. And of course, that's why they were sorely missed in the village. You know, uh, their energy, their spirit, their imagination, determination to change something, you know, to change the living conditions. And as they had no chance to do this in Galicia, they got up and left. Uh, so emigration always was, and is nowadays, it's always a fantastic brain drain, of course, for a country and for a village, you know, for any society, is a brain drain. And, but it also had other negative consequences, for instance, that when a peasant left, he usually sold, he had to sell his house, the little land he had, to get some money, the money he needed to, to buy the ticket. And this was very often not bought up by a neighbor, not bought up by another peasant, but it was bought, bought up by an outsider, you know, very often by agents. This was also one of the reasons why they told the farm, the peasant to go, because he wanted his land, you know. Uh, by some other people, you know, uh, but mostly by outsiders. So this was really breaking up also this, this closely knit uh, peasant society, you know, there's outsiders uh, buying, buying this land. And it also turned the traditional order of a village sometimes upside down. Now, of course, I'm, uh, this is not to be criticized, uh, but it, this was often the case when people from the lower levels of village society came back from America, because that's what the people did. They didn't, in those days, they did usually not go to America to stay there, or many of them didn't, but to come back to buy something, you know, to invest, really, as we would, as we would say today. To earn some money, of course, you'd stay there for a couple of years to earn money, and then you come back and invest this money in buying land, this was the main reason for emigration. 
because that was the so-called land hunger in, in Galicia, it was fantastic. You know, land was really a mythical thing, you know, to get land. This was a dream. Everybody dreamt of having more land, which was understandable because they, they had so little, you know. They had so little land, so they were, they were dreaming about. So they go to America, make money, come back, you know, and invest this, buy land, renovate the house, get married. For this, you also need money, as everybody knows, you know, or paying the debt or whatever, you know. Uh, so this turns sometimes the order in the village upside down, because this man who is formerly maybe one of the poor people in the village, he comes back and all of a sudden he's a rich man. You know, because two, three years in America was enough to make him rich in comparison with a village, in a village society. So he bought more land, so he bought, built himself a bigger house, and all of a sudden, you know, in a very traditional society, where this was really from generation to generation, one was rich, the other one was poor, and this was not to change. But all of a sudden this changed, you know. The poor one all of a sudden was a rich man. So the authorities, the traditional authorities, the big landowner, the priest, the gendarme, the soltis, the head of the village, the clerk in the next town, they looked on emigration, you know, sort of very critically. They didn't like this. Those people came back and all of a sudden, you know, they, they became rich and they lost, they themselves lost influence as the people gained experience and self-confidence in America. And the authorities also complained that an unwanted result of emigration was a general loosening of moral behavior and neglecting of religious duties. This very often you find when you read uh, newspapers or letters, you know, very often the pr local priests were complaining, you know, people coming back from America with a sort of loose morale, you know. Before they had left, you know, they were going to church uh, every Sunday and, and now all of a sudden, you know, you'd say, why, why should I go to church? He probably, I mean, probably he went in America also to church, but anyway, that was loosening really, really his morale. Uh, but was one of the, the main factors, really, and a very interesting factor is what I want to point, uh, focus on, is this selling the land to, to an outsider. You know, selling the land to somebody who is a stranger. This is a phenomenon we have at that time all over Europe. You know, I come myself, from, myself my family comes from Slovenia, but they were Germans. And exactly the same thing happened there, you know. Exactly the same thing happened there, that everybody was afraid that once somebody sells something, an outsider would buy it, you know, a stranger, somebody from another ethnic group would buy it. And this, would, this was considered to be a great, great danger. And this same, same thing you find in, in Galicia, you know, you find in propaganda, you know, don't sell your land because a Pole will buy it, a German will buy it, or the other way, you know, don't sell land because the German will buy it, Ukrainian will buy it, you know. This uh, fear that the outsider, you know, the stranger, will buy and will sort of break up your society. This was in the 19th century, of course, you, you know, with the rise of, of, of nationalism in, in 19th century. So this idea was very much in, in, in the propaganda. Uh, you know, so every village really became, in this kind of propaganda, became a bastion, it became a fortress. And when you read the literature of the late 19th century, you find this very often, you know, that every village is really a bastion of a nation, a national bastion, you know, to f everybody who is, who is selling out, he's a traitor to his nation, you know, because he's endangering his nation, his, and, uh, and this idea you find uh, very much. And so emigration played, of course, an important role in, in, in all this. Because with emigration, all of a sudden, because before, not much land was sold. Everybody kept on to his land, as little as he had. But now with emigration, all of a sudden, you know, whole villages left, let's say, in a decade or two decades, you know. And of course, they were selling it before this, this hadn't happened. So this, this was really uh, quite important. 
The same, as I said, was true for other parts of Austria, but not only Austria. I mean, we have, the, we have this conflict between Germans and Poles. You know, the Germans were afraid that the Poles will invade, as they said, Germany. You know, because they're coming as workers in Germany, they would stay in Germany, they would buy land in Germany, and all of a sudden, you know, they were afraid a German village will turn into a Polish village. The same thing happened in Austria. You know, we were, Austrians were afraid of the Czechs. Austrians were afraid of the Slovenes. You know, my parents, great grandparents, were afraid of the Slovenes. You know, they're always thinking about a wave of Slovenes sort of rolling over Austria. I mean, there were two million Slovenes, you know, so much of a wave, you know. But there was always painting this danger on the wall. And there were those associations uh, founded only to buy up land. You know, when somebody had sold land, these associations, German associations, but also other nations had the same, same thing, to buy up the land from an emigrant, you know, so it doesn't fall into the hand of the enemy. And this was also very much, uh, very important in, in Galicia. Many emigrants, as I've mentioned already, didn't go really to, 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 the U, to America to stay there forever, but they went to and fro. You know, very many of them went to, the, to, to America, not so many to Canada, but to America, to stay for two and three years. Then they come back, then they go again. And this kind of emigration, you know, sort of what we call in German, we call them America Gänger. You know, they were going to America, but always coming back. This was also very important for the, for the Galician village. Because this changed the Galician village. You know, these people coming back, they were called then the Americans, because they were dressed differently. You know, they had better houses, they, had, they were richer. You know, they could invest, they, they bought some machinery, which they had probably, probably uh, seen in America, you know. And so this changed the whole, whole lifestyle in, in a Galician village. And it's not only these people, not only the people who had come back, but also, the, of course, the people who had stayed here. Because what did they do? They always, always sent money back home. And this is one of the principles of emigration, of course. This is also today the poorest immigrant today, the poorest African, the poorest Syrian. He tried, or from Chechnya, he would try to send money home, you know, as little as he has but some of it he will send home. And even in those days, you know, the same thing happened, of course, from Canada, from America, they always sent money home. There were different ways to send the money home. Very often this was not by official banks or post office, because these people didn't much believe in clerks. You know, they didn't believe in this official thing, but they rather gave it to, to somebody who came from the same village and he probably probably went home, or to an innkeeper in this place where they lived because he was from the same village originally and he said, well, I have my ways to send it. And it's quite interesting when you study this uh, that there were different uh, charges, you know, and different rates of exchange, you know. There was a different rate of exchange for a Pole, there was a different rate of exchange for a Ukrainian and for a Jew, you know. If, if somebody sent a dollar, you know, to Austria, it depended on his nationality, really, how much the guy there got, you know. The Jew usually got most, you know, the Ukrainians got, got uh, the least, you know. So, of course, this, this was very, very much changing the Galician village. You know, this emigration is two ways. There's one, the emigrants coming back and investing and changing. Also, you know, it's not only that they're materially, you know, sort of in a materialistic sense changing the village, but also in the thought. Because what had they learned? You know, that they learned a new way of thinking, that they learned a new lifestyle. They learned, for instance, to work not by the sun, but by time, you know, because when they probably were in a, in, a, in a factory, you know, or some steel mill 
in Pennsylvania. I mean, you couldn't go to the steel mill when the sun rises and you, you left the steel mill when the sun settles, you know. But you had to be there at, I don't know, six o'clock in the morning, you know. There's no discussion about it. So they learned what this means. So they learned a more pragmatic way, you know, more materialistic way. And they brought back these new ideas. And they also brought back, very often, books. They started to read newspapers, brochures, you know, whatever. Jaroslav Hritzak said, told me, he once told me, uh, that the first bookshelves in Galicia, in Ukrainian houses, so farmhouses, had shown up with, with emigrants. You know, it was really emigrants, the first ones who brought these books back, and, and that's how, how, this, how this whole thing developed. So, and it's quite, quite interesting, when even the same, same, is, same is for the Polish society, you know, it's also in, in Western Galicia. There's an interesting Polish uh, historian of literature, Stanisław Pigon. He comes from a small village, and he has observed how his village has changed with emigration. And it's fantastic. He's seen, you know, in, in, his, in a couple of decades, how the houses became bigger, how the thinking of the people had changed, you know, how their lifestyle had changed, and how, on the other hand, society, the sort of closely knit uh, village society, had disintegrated, you know. So that was one of the uh, results, of course, of emigration. So on the whole, I would say that emigration was, on the whole, it was of course a blessing. It was a blessing for the village because it had changed, you know, through emigrants and also the money emigrants sent and the new ideas emigrants brought back. This was a fantastic, a fundamental change in Galicia. This was very important. Uh, and it also, of course, changed the countries where they went to. Now, this is not the topic of, of our talk today, you know, but it also changed. And it was also, emigration, of course, was a blessing for the countries where they went to. It was a blessing for Canada. Now, but I don't have to tell you this here, because, I mean, this you know much better than me. Thank you very much. I look at the book. You like some water? What? Would you like some water? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Bullock. We're ready to open the uh, floor to questions. Okay, thank you. So, um, ready to begin? If uh, anyone has some questions, you're to the full floor now. Yeah. 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 Can you stand? I'm Ukrainian, but uh, I've been researching my family, and your talk just answered so many questions I have about my own grandfather immigrating to Canada, going for ages and whatnot. So thank you very much. <laughs> okay, thank you. So there's no answer to that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, Professor Van Dyke. I have a question. Uh, adapted. Well, in the early uh, 1900s, there was a big immigration to Kazakhstan as a result of the Solipedal Report. And actually there were quite a few Germans that ended up there. Was this part of the same wave or was this something different? Did people from Western Ukraine go to Kazakhstan at all or was it mostly... I'm, 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 I'm afraid I don't know much about this. But yeah. there was, of course, there was also an immigration to Russia, you know. Yes. They were also going to Russia. And when I told you this, this story, you know, about Rudolf, who became the emperor of, of Brazil, there was another of these stories, which goes as follows. That the Tsar and the Austrian emperor, they made an agreement that the Tsar would give the Austrian emperor his Jews, while the Austrian emperor would give the Tsar his Ukrainians. You know. <laughs> and so many Ukrainians believed this, you know, and they said, okay, the Ukrainians would get the houses and whatever the Jews had, because the Jews would go to Austria. You know, and you go over there, 
and you be, be greeted, you know, and you get, you, you know, these houses are just waiting for you. And so whole villages really along the border left to go to Russia. Of course, the Russians didn't know anything about this. So they were surprised what all these, these villages doing here. You know, what do they want? <coughs> they sent them back, you know. And this was a whole, you know, scandal really. You know, and it went through the newspapers, of course, you know, there was a big confusion. And there's these, sometimes these poor guys had sold their homes, you know, already. So, I mean, he comes back, he doesn't have where to live. There's a question back there. Yes, thank you very much uh, for your uh, overview of uh, the, your emphasis on the two-edged uh, 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 nature of uh, integration. Uh, and one little puzzle emerged, though, in your uh, uh, presentation. Uh, and maybe you could just uh, elaborate on it a little bit. Uh, because uh, it, it, it's like two things that are contradictory and they can't, they can't exist at the same time. On the one hand, uh, your characterization of uh, the peasant people who uh, are being recruited to immigrate to America, uh, who saw themselves as Jewish, they didn't have any national consciousness. But, but later in your talk, you, you uh, are, talk, are saying that uh, uh, people had an awareness of uh, who was of what nationality, and it was important that whether uh, land was going to be purchased by an outsider or not. So, um, are, is this, was this uh, story of the development of national consciousness something missing in your? Yeah, of course. Yeah, or, yeah. No, no. Or was the no, I, I, I've, I've, I've. Uh, yeah. I've shortly mentioned, you know, this change of thinking, you know, in the, in the late 19th century, you know, when the people became more conscious, you know, and so their attitude and also their national consciousness changed. So they became really, uh, or they were turned from, from Ruthenians into Ukrainians, you could say, you know. Uh, and so, and, and very often, you know, this what I, what I was talking about, you know, this didn't so much concern the people themselves. But this was more the propaganda, you know, this was more going through the newspapers. You know, the guy who sold the house, he didn't consider himself being a traitor, you know. It was not him who was thinking this way, you know, but it was mostly some other people, you know. And, and so the same is, same is true in, in, in Slovenia, you know. But, I mean, this has changed in, you know, sort of 1880s and Around 1900, uh, there, there was a different way of thinking. Uh, back there. And those who left Ukraine and went to North America, or Brazil, or Russia, um, what proportion of them do you think went back to Ukraine and what proportion stayed overseas? Uh, this is very difficult to answer because there are no real hard numbers on that. But there are guesses, educated guesses, that a, approximately a fourth went back. Approximately a fourth. Now, the interesting thing is that less people went back from Canada, you know, more from America. And of course, people who settled here, you know, with a homestead here, they didn't go back. I mean, they didn't come here to, to settle, you know, to go back. So it was usually the workers, you know, like from Pennsylvania, you know, in the steel mill or, or wherever. I mean, he would go there and he would treat this as seasonal work, you know, it's two or three years or four years or whatever. You know, and then he'd made his money, you know, saved up a certain sum, and then he'd go back. But not, of course not, and many, of course, as you know, settled in, in Canada. So there was much less, there's even an Austrian, uh, very early Austrian uh, scholar Leopold Caro studied this and he writes that less, far less people from Canada went back than from the United States. Okay. <coughs> I'm, I'm quite interested in this topic and recently I've discovered a phenomenon or an organization called the Saint Raphael yeah, yeah. Society and it seems to me 
that they may be responsible for exactly this change of the kind of immigration happening in Canada as first as the United States. I don't know, are you familiar yeah. with this? Yeah, or? yeah, of course. Yeah, they, they were. You know, there were these, these, these associations being formed that were helping with the immigrants, because the immigrants were so cheated so much, you know. And then some people said, look, I mean, we have to do something about it. You know, and so the Poles had their associations, the Ukrainians had them, uh, everybody had it, really, just to help them. You know, because they were not only cheated by agents in, in, in Galicia or in Germany. But they were also cheated when they got to, to here, you know. Because who was waiting for them? Well, if he was lucky, it was his family waiting. Yeah, but if, if he was not lucky, you know, it was again some kind of an agent, you know, to, who'd tell him where to go, you know, and things like this. It was really fantastic, you know, the way, the way people were treated then. You know, we found, when I was doing this research, you know, on, on, on the Emperor of America, I found that People have been sent to Hawaii, you know. Ukrainians have been sent to Hawaii to work in plantations there. Although they wanted to go to Brazil, you know. They bought more or less a ticket to Brazil, you know. The agent for a whole ship, shipload, you know. And the agent sent the whole ship to Hawaii because he had an order from some plantationer, you know, in, in Hawaii that he needed workers. And who was a good worker? It was a Galician peasant, you know. So he said, okay. You know, he got the money, he sent him to Hawaii. I mean, when the guy arrived, he didn't have an idea where he was, you know. I mean, nobody said, uh, uh, welcome in Hawaii. He probably thought for the first year he'd be in Brazil, you know. The same happened to Polish, Polish immigrants, you know. Hawaii was a very, very <laughs> well-known spot, you know. And so, these, these associations like, uh, you know, the one you mentioned, they were helping them, you know, in these ways. You know, they were advising them. And this has also to do, of course, with sort of raising of, of consciousness, you know, that the, there was, let's say, a self-organization, you know. We do something about our own people. The same what the Poles did, you know, Polish priests, Polish journalists, you know, even there were journalists going sort of as immigrants, you know, to write stories, you know, what we also have today, you know, you, you pretend you're an immigrant, you pretend you're a worker, you go to a factory to write, to write a reportage, you know. Even in those days you find fantastic material, you know, because people wanted to find out what's really happening, what's really going on, you know. Because of course immigration was also a huge topic, you know, it was an interesting story. You know, it was an interesting story and it was going through the newspapers. When you read the newspapers from the 90s, 1890s to 1914, you know, it was always a very interesting story. You know, because it was a mixture of crime, you know, sensation, you know, people going to Brazil and they've been told, you know, they're milk trees. You know, you just cut into a tree and fresh milk comes out, you know. And they believed it, you know. Or, you don't do the housework there, there are monkeys there. You don't have to pay the monkey, you know. They do the washing up, you know. Uh, today we all know that in order to travel or to immigrate, you know, have the whole procedure. You have to go to custom office, you, know, you have to go to bureaucracy. What about that time? What were the legal conditions? Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting piece. There was not really, uh, there were no passports at that time, you know. And in Austria at least, immigration was not illegal. The main thing was that people had done the military service. That was the main thing what the Austrian authorities were, were worried about, you know. And this, of course, was also, I didn't mention it here, was also one of the reasons why people emigrated, why young men emigrated, to dodge the draft, you know. So this was also a reason why they were smuggled across the border. You know, because men 18 years or 20 years old who hadn't done his military service, and it was quite long then, you know, was not allowed to emigrate, you know. So you needed some kind of, uh, you know, there were some conditions to be filled. What was also important was that you had to have enough money. Because, you know, the police, 
the gendarmes, uh, whoever the authorities were alerted that any emigrants who've been caught without money, and you find this also in, in Stefanik's work, you know, Stefanik at that time was, was studying in, in Krakow, and the Krakow train station was one of the spots where they were gathering. And so the police would go there and ask the people, okay, show me your money. They're saying, what, what do you have today, you know? When you go across the border, okay, do you have enough money? You know, because that's, that's, that's the main concern, you know, that the, the, that the guy without money, okay, he'd need help, you know, and, and somebody has to help him, the authorities, they were not interested in this, you know. So you had these, these conditions, yes. And, of course, one very important condition was health. As everybody knows, you know, we all know these pictures from Ellis Island, you know, where they're looking into the eyes of, of the people, you know, health. So you were not admitted if you were ill, you know, or, or whatever, you know. So probably, you know, I, I would have problems here. But I even was prepared to have problems here, so I brought a letter from my, from my doctor, you know, that I've gone through chemotherapy. That's why I lost my hair. <laughs> so even today, you know. <laughs> You have to be prepared. Yes. You're a brother back there? You indicated that one of the, uh, that the people who tended to immigrate were the ambitious and entrepreneurial types. But I think there is also an element of primogeniture in there, in that you had traditional paternalistic societies. The oldest son would typically inherit the land. They had huge families. And so what was to happen with all the other sons? Yeah, of course. Didn't get any land? Yeah, 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 of course. I mean this was this this was the unfortunate thing that was splitting up the land and, and so I mean they had so little land, yes, only one could work on the land. Because I mean you couldn't split it up anymore any longer. Of course. Yeah, this this was one of the one of the and it became of course it became a tradition, you know, and this very often is a local local thing that there is one village which is emigrating and the next village is not. And this is very often it's just by chance, you know. If one was emigrating from this one village, he would pull not the rest of the village, but many from this village, you know, because he was successful. Or he came back and he was considered to be the American, you know, dressed differently, with money. So other people said, okay, I'll try it as, as well. And there were villages, you know, from which nobody had emigrated, you know, and they, they had this tradition, no, no, America, we don't want to know about this, you know, we better stay here, you know. So, I mean, you cannot generalize, of course. I mean, it's very often so. Therefore, these local studies, like this Pigon I was mentioning, these local studies are very valuable, you know, because they're real micro studies, you know, a village or two villages and to compare them. So we really need to, to have more of these local studies, you know, and, and not the general picture, because the general picture is always false. Very background. I don't know if you didn't mention in your comments anything about religion in the sense of religious influence that came back from the world. The problem was all that priests didn't want to go from religion to the immigrants here, the authorities of the immigrants, the issues with that, they're also the ones that came here and encountered Russian Orthodox <coughs> and went back. Uh, do you find anything in the press about that? Uh, well, I must, I must say quite frankly, I didn't, didn't really study that very much, because uh, in my material this didn't play, play much of a role. Uh, but of course this was important, and, and in Galicia you have this, also in Galicia you have this fact that <coughs> villages change the, 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 you know, the change from the Unia Church to, to Orthodox Church. Uh, for instance, my publisher in, in, in Poland, they live in a former Ukrainian village, and they have two cemeteries there, you know. And so, I mean, there's no reason to, in, in such a small village, to have two cemeteries. But one, of course, is an Orthodox cemetery, and the other one is a Greek Catholic cemetery, because this whole village had changed it's, it's, it's religion, and this also is, is important, of course, for, uh, for emigration. But it usually was the priests, they did not want people to emigrate. You know, they were against emigration. Uh, because, as I mentioned, you know, 
emigration was in their eyes loosening the morale you know people who came back were not listening anymore or not as good as before to the priest and to the big landowner and, and so on so the priests were usually it was the church was very much against against it on the whole you know again you cannot generalize about Canada, you know, I, I wouldn't know, uh, you know, the, the problems of, of the Greek Catholic and Orthodox Church in, in Canada. I wouldn't know about that. Dr. Corkins, I wonder whether you are aware of the Maritime Museum in Bremen, yeah. where uh, the ship manifests, all the ship manifests. Uh, uh, the passenger lists are available and um, it wouldn't be nice to have that online whether someone could put all this information online so that uh, for instance there, there is a PhD uh, um, a, a topic that, that uh, you could discover how many Ukrainian names returned Mm. Uh, just by observing the yeah. ship manifest. Yeah. But many of, uh, a lot of this material is actually online. You know, for instance, Ellis Island, most of, most of the ships who arrived in America, I don't know about Canada, that's online. You know, the, the passenger lists are online. You know. Also from Germany, you know, Hamburg and Bremen, they are online. I know, because I did most of my research really on the internet. You know, and there you find this, you have these fantastic uh, episodes. You know, I was doing, I start my story with a couple of Slovaks actually from Slovakia. And they walked up to Oshvienčim, you know, on foot. That very often happened. You know, they didn't even have the money for the train. They were caught there by the police and arrested and they escaped and went to America. So I was doing, trying to do as good of research as possible on these few people. There was a small group of people. And then in the internet, I found out that somebody else is also doing this research on the same group, on the one guy called Popovich, you know. So I wrote to her, it's a lady in the United States, and I found out that she's a, you know, this is one of her great grandparents. Though she has an Italian Christian, Christian name and a Scandinavian surname. You know, but she's of Slovak heritage. And she had done this for years. And then she shared all the results with me. It was fantastic, really. You know, so if you go through the internet, you know, you find fantastic material, fantastic material. But of course, you also have to go through the archives, you know, because in the archives, there's still a lot to be found. You know, I was in the, in the archives in Krakow, also in Lviv, and in Krakow, Apparently, you know, sometimes I had the impression I was the first one to open something, you know. You know, it was so dusty, it was so dirty, you know. And, and uh, there's a lot, lot to be found, also in Vienna, of course. Okay. I asked you if there could be a, uh, an agent, seemed to be rather lucrative. How did you get to be an agent? Buy your way in and no, no, no. Well, this, this is, I mean, this is really a special problem. I, I didn't go into this problem. Yeah. The agents were mostly Jewish. The local agents, you know, sort of the Galician agents were almost entirely Jewish. Why? It was not because the Jews are such, you know, characters. But to be an agent, you need to be able to read and write. You know, so the local peasant was very often an illiterate man. So he couldn't be an agent because you had to, you know, contact one way or the other with, with the office in, in Hamburg, you know. So it was Jews. And of course, you know, it's also the economical situation of the Jews. They were usually, you know, the, they, they had an idea about money. You know, very often the, the local peasant had never done anything with money, you know, because this was really, the economy was based on bartering, sort of on this local level. <clears throat> so, and you didn't, there, there was not really sort of, 
they were not officially employed, or at least most of them were not officially employed. They were big agents. They were big agents, for instance, working for Brazil. There was two brethren, also Jewish, but Italian, Nadari, and they got a commission, for instance, to send a million people. You know, Brazil ordered a million people. You know, so he then had his sub, sub, sub agents, you know, and that's how it worked. But usually, uh, a man who'd, who had an idea, you know, who was good in business, he'd go there and he'd propose. And they would say, okay, you get us a man, you know, for the ship and you get a commission. You know, and that was enough. You know, you, they didn't need to employ him. And so then they formed these, these sometimes there were real gangs, you know, like these, these people in Vadovice who were put on trial. It was a whole gang, you know. And they were not only agents, everybody, you know, the people working on railway, you know, uh, officials, you know, gendarmes, they were on the pay, you know, on the payroll of these agents, you know. Because they were interested that everybody would go to Oshvienchim. There were also other places where it could cross the border, but they had the office in Oshvienchim, so they wanted everybody to go to Oshvienchim. They said, you're not allowed to go through another you know, town. You must go through Oshvienchim. You know? And the guy in the train already, when he wanted to buy a ticket somewhere else, the conductor he said, no, this is not allowed. You, know? you need to go to Oshvienchim. So how was he to know this is not true, you know? He always believed, he was taught to believe everything what the authority, somebody in a, in a uniform, was telling him, you know? And that's what I said, you know, this kind of thinking later changed, you know? Later he would say, who, who is telling me this? I mean, I want a ticket there, you know? And, and you go to hell, you know? So. My, my question is related to that. So in Canada, I think there were a lot of CPR agents, canard-like agents, and they were trying to settle the West because the CPR needed separate. But in the States, and I sort of asked you that earlier, yeah. there was a lot of people went to work with Pennsylvania. into Pennsylvania about the same time that the mining companies were destroying the Irish uh, I think they were called the Mountain McGuire. Yeah. So the mining company must have had. Yeah, yeah. Agent. They had, yeah, but they didn't have the agent there. They had the agent here, you know. So they were waiting for them probably in Ellis Island or, or in New York, you know, where the people were landing. And they were getting off the boat and they would say, okay, you know, because you were not allowed in if you already had a workplace, you know, this was one of the conditions, you know, in, in, in the United States at least, you know, you were not allowed. They were asking you, do you have a workplace? Do you know already where to work? You said yes, you were sent back, you know. So you, you were not allowed to have this. So they were waiting for him, and of course they needed labor, you know, they needed people, and as you said, you know, they were in conflict with the Irish who were organized, and so the Galicians were ideal for them, because they were not organized. They did not have any idea about labor organization, because they were not laborers themselves. They were farmhands, they were farmers, they were peasants. So they would never been organized, they never, they never heard about the strike. I mean, a peasant doesn't strike, I mean, you know. So they were ideal for them. And also they didn't speak the language, you know. So they were, I mean, the propaganda you know, sort of socialist propaganda did not really reach them, you know. And, and this is one of the reasons why they were really waiting here for them already, you know, and, and shipping them then to Pennsylvania. Yeah. Because Pennsylvania, of course, were, and the other reason was that they were paying fairly well, you know. I mean, they were getting usually one dollar a day, you know, which in their eyes was a fortune, you know was a fortune. Of course, I mean, the living conditions, you know, living was not so cheap as they probably thought, you know, it, it would be. And it's quite interesting, when you go through these materials, you know, you also find how the people lived, you know. I mean, they're being, they came by steerage, so they've been put in a, in a ship, you know, like, like cargo. And also, I mean, they lived this way here, you know, the many, many in, in one room, you know just to save as much money as possible. 
There's a question way back there. One of the uh, issues that uh, tickled a lot of uh, immigrants from, uh, from that area in Canada previous labor was the issue of being reservist. Uh, can you comment on how that reservist uh, process worked and uh, the responsibilities? And I don't know if you touched on that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding the word. Your military reservist. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's what I said. I mean, that, uh, you know, people who were, had not done the military service, and they were also considered, of course, you know, if you were a reservist, you were not allowed to go, you know. So the authorities would say, no, you know, you are still on the list, you know, on a reservist list, and they were not allowed to go, you know. So many people, many young men, were not uh, theoretically not allowed to go. So this is also one of the reasons why you needed an agent, you know, to get you across the border. Because this was also one of a role of the agent, you know, either to bribe you across the border, which was possible, of course, you know, to bribe, or to cross somewhere, you know, where, where you know. So would they get a little certificate or a note or something from the government saying that they are no longer the service? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would get a paper. Yeah, they, yeah, they would get a paper. Yes. They would get a paper. And this, I mean, it was very often, it was really up to the authority, you know, if they believe him or not. And in many cases, they didn't believe him, they sent him back anyway, you know. So there were many reasons why they would send them back. You know, this is also for the authorities, was a two-edged sword, you know. On the one hand, of course, immigration was greeted because it was taken off pressure, the country, you know, because it was overpopulated, you know, so they didn't know what to do with all these people. So they were afraid, you know, God knows what, you know, unrest breaking out or whatever. So, I mean, they were aware of this situation. So emigration was a way, you know, to get rid of this, and also, of course, which is also true today, you know, the money coming from America was important for our economy. You know, these were, I mean, for a single person, it was a small sum, but on the whole, it was quite fantastic. You know, when you ask today, you know, how much, you know, in certain countries, you know, and the, the budget really relies very often on, on foreign, you know, people working abroad. You know, this is very much true for Moldova. You know, it's true for Romania, you know. So the money sent there is really keeping up the economy. And this was also not, not on the same uh, level, but it's also true, of course, in, in Galicia, you know. So the authorities, on the one hand, were afraid, you know, because it was mainly the army, you know, the army was always against it. Of course, because they, they were losing their men. It was the best man, as I said, you know, the most energetic young man, you know, they would need in the army, of course, you know. I mean, they want him. So he would be in America. You know, it's also about this, this Slovaks I was talking about, you know. It was mainly that they were young and they, you know, they dodged the draft. And this was the main concern of the authorities. But on the other hand, you know, the authorities were quite, quite happy, you know, to be rid of these people, you know, because they were surplus. So they didn't, they didn't have work for them, you know, there were no factories, you know, no industry really building up in, in Galicia. Mm -hmm. One more question here. I started a I said I started shall I be the last. Okay, no, I first a statement. I actually came to the United States through from Bremen. It's been ten days in Ellis Island, but that's not my question. Currently in uh, the prairies, a lot of the farmers will, at least one or maybe more of the sons, will engage in seasonal labor. 
road repair, railroad repair. In the early immigration, of course, it was forestry, railroad work, very often a seasonal labor. What I wanted to ask was, does, did the pattern of seasonal labor you mentioned, like going to the United States and coming back, was, did that pattern exist in Europe, or did that pattern start with immigration to the West? No, 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 it existed. That's, this I, I, I believe I've mentioned, you know, that that emigration had existed even before in Galicia. You know, people were used to this idea, you know, because they, they've been going to, to Germany, they've been going to Poland, they've been going to Hungary, you know, uh, they've been going to Romania and even to Russia. You know, when somebody, a big landowner, landowner needed workers, you know, and again, this was usually done by an agent, you know, because how should the guy in a Galician village get to know that somewhere in Romania they need, need work, you know. You need somebody to tell them, to get them, you know, and, 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 and bring them there. Can I just display that off? What type of seasonal labor was it? Was it agriculture? Agriculture. No, this was, this was strictly, this was strictly, not, not strictly agriculture, because in Germany it was very often mining, you know. These were also the poles, and that's what I said, you know, in, in Germany they had a law that, interestingly enough, they had a law, you know, in Prussia, they had a law that the poles were not allowed to stay over winter, you know, they had to go back. Also the people working in mines, which didn't make sense because of course in a mine you also work in winter, but the Germans were afraid that the poles would settle. Now the same law did not apply to Galicians did not apply to Ukrainians. A Ukrainian could stay over winter, you know. But the Poles were really strictly looked upon as seasonal labor, and there was already this national conflict going on. You know, that's what I said, the national conflict. You know, that the Germans uh, were afraid, you know, the Poles would take over, or God knows what, you know. And so they had, they passed this law that they were only allowed to stay for a certain time and not, I don't remember now the dates, I think in October they had to leave and come back in March or something like this. You know. Thank you, um, and we'd like to thank you for uh, your uh, perseverance and your, and your energy, um, uh, knowing that you uh, had such a long journey, and of course uh, knowing that you had recent uh, problems with your health. I'd like to now, uh, uh, ask the president of the uh, Ukrainian Professional Business Club of Edmonton to uh, come and say a few words. Yes, I don't, I don't know if it's an indication of the partnership that has developed between our two organizations or if Bogdan has telepathic powers, but basically, basically in his introduction he literally took the words out of my mouth. The only correction I would make is that originally the club was called the Ukrainian Professional and Business Men's Club. <laughs> And over the years, what was the men's club has also seen different iterations. Uh, now as the Ukrainian-Canadian Professional and Business Association of Edmonton, just a, a little bit of an advert, we are planning on having our annual general meeting in April, and would uh, hope that many of you here can attend, so stay tuned for more information, more details on the time and the place. Having already thanked Dr. Savarin and his executive of the time for their Archimedes moment in creating the Shevchenko Lecture Program, let me return to today and note that while the very first Shevchenko Lecture was George Shevardov, Yuri Shevardov, as we mentioned, also known as Yuri Shadow, he was actually born as Yuri Schneider. Both parents were German and his father was a senior army officer in the Russian Tsarist army. So it's no coincidence that when we chose the today's, today's speaker, Martin Pollock, we uh, chose someone who began, also began his post-secondary studies as a student of Slavic literature and East European history. We are grateful to him for having been able to bring us to, to us today some of the stories from the old world using archival documents from newspapers and court proceedings which reflected the lived reality of the time, a lived reality which our North American scholars have not placed much emphasis on, legitimately focusing on the experiences of, of the pioneers once they arrived here. So thank you, Dr. Pollock, for bringing to us another viewpoint and informing that viewpoint using your skills as a journalist to bring the stories to life. 
So on behalf of those present, I once again wish to, to uh, extend our sincerest thanks for your work in presenting today, and I'm pleased to present this small token of our gratitude for your being with us today. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, once again, I have to thank you, really, to invite me here. It was, was great. You know, it was very interesting. Thank you very much.